other. Both of them are Next. Now we are live. This is my father. Okay. Bye, sir. Bye bye. Bye, sir. Bye, bye, sir. Nice to meet you, sir. Okay, I'm uh, muting you. Sharing screen. Dear friends, we were talking about the early 20th century. In the early 20th century, realism had given way to naturalism. The most important proponent of naturalism in drama was Hendrik Ibsen. Of course, he was not American, he was European. In drama, there were very big changes that were happening at this time. Realism was there, but and naturalism also, but then avant-garde movements like expressionism were making their presence felt in European drama at this time. Strindberg, Ionesco, uh, Ibsen, etc. were pioneers of big changes in drama. And Eugene O'Neill brought realism on the American stage. For the first time, realistic drama came on the American stage in the works of Eugene O'Neill. Eugene O'Neill was also a pioneer in many other ways. He brought naturalism on American stage. He brought expressionism on American stage. He brought um, African-American characters and their dialects on American stage for the first time. At this time, New York City. You want to say something, Kaina Gazelle? Many people are, what happened? Something is wrong. What happened? Ma'am, your YouTube video is public. Ah, <laughs> uh, let it be. Eh? I, can't, I don't know how to change it now. One day. Dear friends in YouTube, this is our paid course. I am teaching uh, realism in drama and Eugene O'Neill today. But uh, by mistake, I went public. Uh, but I think that's okay. We did not have a live session for a long time. I had throat problems and uh, I need another set, another few weeks of treatment. So I think I won't be able to teach in YouTube or even in the live classroom for a couple of weeks. So that is why I wanted to tell you this in a video. I was going to tell you one of these days. So if you're watching me live today, don't worry, be with us on uh, for realism in drama and uh, Eugene O'Neill today. Okay, guys, luckily we got together today. Our paid students, there are 98 paid students attending live now, right now. So no problem. Let us for the time being uh, talk about realism in drama, right? Um, after Eugene O'Neill, uh, we will see. Okay. So realism in drama was a very big movement that rocked entire Europe and America. Uh, in Europe, realism led to uh, social criticism. Society, upper class society especially, and its uh, oppression of the working classes was really criticized by many writers, including Henry Gibson, Eugene O'Neill, etc. Uh, Eugene O'Neill was uh, experimenting with many styles, as I just told you. And uh, it was uh, in Broadway, like I told you yesterday, I think, uh, West End is the 
most important place for theatres in London. In London, there is a very rich uh, street, big road called West End, and there are 40 theatres there. Like that in New York, it is Broadway. In Broadway, there are so many rich, rich theatres. And uh, in Broadway, Eugene O'Neill became a very big sensation. And uh, the time of the First World War was a time of great political writing and uh, lots of uh, experiments happened. You know, Eugene O'Neill brought classical elements into drama because society was falling apart. Modernism was there in literature. Modernism was there in poetry, especially, and fiction. So in drama also, all these changes were felt at this time in the First World War and before the Second World War. Writers exemplary for domestic realism are domestic realism means stories of families and the way in which they uh, develop. Uh, these kind of plays were written by Eugene O'Neill, Arthur Miller and Tennessee Williams. As you might know, Arthur Miller and Tennessee Williams are very important figures um, when it comes to depression literature, depression era in literature starts with Arthur Miller and Tennessee Williams. And actually there are modernist elements in all these three writers. All these three writers wrote domestic realism, modernist elements. Remember in modernism, domestic realism is an important element. Uh, D.H. Lawrence, for example, wrote domestic realism. D.H. Lawrence, even James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, etc., wrote about the um, families and the discord within the families, the problems within the families. Characters are unable to, um, you know, belong to their families. They want to escape. They want to try out uh, new ways of life. So the individual in conflict with the family, that is the theme of domestic realism. And it is a very important aspect of modernism. Eugene O'Neill, Arthur Miller, Tennessee Williams all wrote about um, modernist society in this manner. Eugene O'Neill was born in 1888, very important year. Uh, in that period, in the 1880s, uh, D.S. Lawrence, after that, um, you know, uh, Eugene O'Neill, T.S. Eliot, so many important figures were born in 1888 and also um, they all became pioneers of writing in, in, in literature. They all became pioneers in many ways. Before Eugene O'Neill, American theatre consisted of melodrama and farce. Before Eugene O'Neill, American theatre was melodramatic. That means actual literature was not there. It was melodrama, farce. And Eugene O'Neill was one of the first American playwrights to take drama seriously. Eugene O'Neill uh, gave a new seriousness to drama as an aesthetic and intellectual form. Drama became serious. Drama became aesthetically dense. How to uh, bring in elements of beauty and literature into drama how the performance of drama uh, should be changed, how philosophical and intellectual ideas, social criticism, etc., should be, uh, you know, uh, brought into drama. All these are very important aspects of this time. O'Neill experimented with it. O'Neill was one of the first American playwrights. One minute, guys. O'Neill was one of the first American playwrights uh, to not only really take drama seriously, but uh, to use drama as an aesthetic and intellectual form, to use American vernacular on stage, to focus on marginalized characters, poor characters, African-American characters, etc. For the first time came on stage with Eugene O'Neill. He introduced psychological and social realism to the American stage, influenced by Ibsen, Chekhov, and Strindberg. He also employed other techniques such as expressionism and naturalism. Expressionism, you already know, Emperor Jones is a famous example of expressionism. Naturalism, he employed, naturalism is the idea that characters are defined by their environment. Characters are becoming what they are. They are outcasts, they are 
you know, uh, criminals, etc., because of their environment, the, the situation in which they live. And this idea of uh, naturalism is related to social realism also, because naturalism ends up in social criticism. Society is the reason the individual is suffering. Did you understand? And uh, it, in, it was influenced by Ibsen, Chekhov, Strindberg, uh, etc. Strindberg was an expressionist, as you know. Expressionism is psychological. Expressionism is delving into the mind of the uh, characters. Did you understand? And he also employed a variety of genres, comedy, tragedy, mythology, for example, in Desire Under the Elms, in uh, Morning Becomes Electra, we have use of Greek mythology. We will, I will explain all this. And Eugene O'Neill was the only playwright to win Pulitzer Prize four times, Pulitzer Prize in drama four times, Pulitzer Prize in poetry four times, Robert Frost also got. This is um, Eugene O'Neill. There are so many important plays. We will start with Beyond the Horizon. One second, guys. Let me just uh, post this link because people are asking for it and nobody posted, I think. Posting in the group. Uh, <clears throat> so we are going to talk in detail about Eugene O'Neill's uh, place now starting with Beyond the Horizon. Sharing screen again. Beyond the Horizon was a 1918 play. Uh, Beyond the Horizon is the story of two brothers in a Connecticut farm. All okay now? Why again, some people uh, lifted their hand. Is everything okay now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. <clears throat> So Beyond the Horizon is about two brothers, Robert and Andrew. They are farmers. It is set in a Connecticut farm in Northeast USA. Northeast, Matlab, the New England region, isn't it? New England, uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Salem, Boston. Uh, the elder brother is Andrew. The younger brother is Robert. Robert is an intellectual. He is bored with his agricultural upbringing. He does not like farming. He does not want to stay in that place. He wants to go away. He wants to travel. He wants to explore the world. And his dream is to go beyond the horizon. That is the title. The elder brother, Andrew, however, is not so. He is different from his brother, Robert. Uh, Andrew is entirely practical. He is a hard worker and he's a very good farmer. And Andrew, the elder brother, is about to marry the girl called Ruth. Ruth is a local girl, and uh, Andrew is about to marry Ruth. And Robert is planning to go. He is going to join his uncle. He's going to the sea to discover life beyond the horizon. He wants to go and uh, live beyond the horizon, so he is joining his uncle, who is a uh, you know, uh, sailor. He has a ship. His uncle is on a ship. And just before he goes, the day before he goes, Robert meets Ruth. Ruth is his brother's fiancée. And Robert and Ruth talk. Robert reveals to Ruth that he loves her. And then Ruth says, I also love you. Oh my God, then what will happen to Andrew? Robert and Ruth decide to get married. And Andrew, the ship is sailing the next day. Knowing this, Andrew decides to go. Andrew decides to go uh, after, uh, sorry, the, Andrew decides to go with his uncle following Robert's dream. Andrew does not belong to the world. Andrew, Andrew belongs to the farm. 
he should be staying in his farm because he cannot be happy anywhere else but now he is pursuing robert's dream and robert is going to live like andrew rooted in one place did you understand now ruth and robert get married ruth and robert marry very soon ruth realizes that andrew uh, sorry robert is not a good husband he is not ready to uh, look after the farm and what happens to andrew andrew has gone away and andrew is now very ill andrew becomes very ill he is unable to uh, adjust with his travels because he doesn't know uh, how to live anywhere except in his farm so andrew because uh, andrew becomes very ill and robert is also not able to live his life in the farm and robert <clears throat> feels stupid because he doesn't know how to deal with all this he spends a lot of time reading because books are like the window into the world and he does not uh, he is not happy his brother is also not happy andrew comes back after some time after some time andrew comes back and ruth decides to uh, tell andrew that he she wants him not robert robert is devastated but andrew cannot have ruth back you know so the entire uh, relationship is now problematized uh, every all of them lost their dreams lost their lives that is how unil is problematizing love and happiness this is a very uh, you know deep philosophical play showing how human destiny works it is like man proposes god disposes kind of um, drama did you understand and now we'll talk about expressionism and unil unil uh, experimented with expressionism under the inspiration of the swedish playwright august strindberg remember strindberg is swedish he wrote a dream play and the ghost sonata a very major plays and uh, we will talk about him in european literature and strindberg explores complex states of the mind rejecting conventional realism and imitating instead the fluid structure of human consciousness he I, as i told you already expressionism is about the fluid structure of human mind expressionism is not about external realism it is about how human mind creates alternate realities clear guys and the three important plays where he uses expressionism are emperor jones the hairy ape and to some extent the play strange interlude i have added very uh, detailed and uh, you know useful summaries of many of these in the encyclopedia that is coming up and um, uh, encyclopedia is much more advanced than this so i'm trying to bring it out as soon as possible so that you will be able to use it before the exam okay strange interlude is a strange play because it focuses on the interior monologue of its main character nina leads it focuses on the interior monologue of the main character nina leads nina leads is the uh, main character and um, she is giving an interior monologue so her mind is being revealed we will talk in detail about emperor jones emperor jones is a play that shows brutus jones one african american brutus jones is um, a criminal he has escaped from american prison he has come to a caribbean island and there uh, he has become the emperor he manipulated the uh, the native people of that island and he uh, is oppressing them making them think that he is invincible that he cannot be defeated and what happens at the beginning of the play is the natives of the island the caribbean natives they rise in rebellion against the uh, emperor this is what happens and brutus jones is running through the uh, forest brutus jones is trying to escape very confidently he is running through the forest and uh, uh, he sees six hallucinations six hallucinations because slowly slowly he goes out of his mind he is not able to um, you know be sane 
his mind is defeating him and first hallucinations that he sees are his own personal fears personal experiences but after that he begins to see his collective memories things that he did not even experience he began to see as hallucinations did you understand so uh, this is the theme of uh, embra jones at first jones sees little formless fears little formless fears that is what he sees at first um, his own uh, fears are seen in the form of a child you know like children small children like uh, they are moving like worms but they are like children this is how he sees them after that he remembers a man whom he killed he killed a man and that is how he went into prison and that man's name is jeff jeff is um, jeff is uh, uh, his colleague his uh, compatriot his companion they used to work together in pullman porter train did you understand and uh, there um, he fought with jeff and killed him and that jeff's uh, ghost is appearing in his like a, a, a like a vision he is seeing jeff in his Uh, hallucination and the third uh, fear or the third memory that he encounters is his own prison experience as he is running he is seeing these hallucinations in the forest these are like manifestations of his psychological fears the prison experience the prison warden is uh, trying to make him work that is what he sees and then after that his personal memories and then he starts seeing collective memories racial memories then he starts seeing a slave auction he was not a slave he was never a slave but embra jones is an african american who had a slave past so he sees a slave auction he sees a slave ship and then he also sees finally an african witch doctor or a shaman and at the at every hallucination he is firing a bullet at the end uh, at the african witch doctor and his crocodile god he fires one bullet and he exhausts all his bullet all his bullets are finished then there is a silver bullet hanging from his neck he takes the silver bullet and shoots that also the belief that people had the aboriginal people or the native people of caribbean islands that he, where, where he was ruling those people thought that he can kill he can be killed only with a silver bullet this is an untruth this is a lie that the emperor taught the people to show that he is invincible because the people had no access to silver the people had no access to silver and emperor jones thought that uh, you know the people will never be able to kill him so uh, he was wearing a silver bullet to warn the people and to make them think that he can never be killed did you understand and uh, finally uh, he reaches a clearing in the uh, a place in the forest uh, and he falls right in the hands of the uh, caribbean native rebels you know what happened he was running in a circle he lost his way he lost his confidence he lost his clothes from being an emperor he becomes a very elemental primitive man even without clothes like that he is running and he is reaching the uh out the the edge of the forest and he is killed by the uh, rebel leader lem with a silver bullet where did he get a silver bullet from they smelted silver coins and um, uh, they smelt onu varyo they smelted silver coins and made a bullet out of it and he got killed this is what happens to emperor jones so this play is not about action this play is about um, mind it is about the human mind and its fears and its memories the reality created by the mind that is called expressionism mm. so fear is depicted as a state of mind fear is depicted as a state of mind in order to capture the tormented soul of a race did you understand this is the uh, theme of uh, emperor jones so let me read out brutus jones worked as a porter in a pullman train in the us he had gone to prison for killing a man named jeff 
over a craps game. Craps game is a game of dice. Escaping prison, Jones came to the Caribbean island two years ago. There he found the Cockney Englishman Smithers. Spotter Smithers doing Englishman cheating the black natives. You know, wherever you go, there is an Englishman cheating everybody. And here also, Jones joins Smithers, then overcame Smithers. Smithers also became powerless in front of Jones. Jones became the emperor. Look at the picture I got from the internet. Wearing military uniform, he's ruling. At the beginning of the play, the natives are preparing to revolt under Lem, and they are beating their drum. We can hear the drum beats. Uh, or initially, originally, when he starts running, there are 72 beats per minute. What do you mean by that? It is the uh, normal heartbeat of a man. But as the play progresses, Emperor Jones's fears are awakened. Then what happens? The tom-tom beating increases. It becomes fast-paced. Uh, Emperor Jones feels secure in the face of the native revolt because he has already planned his escape in advance. He has money stashed in a foreign bank account. He has an escape route through the woods mapped out in his mind. And he even has food buried at the edge of the forest. He has also convinced the natives that he has magical powers and, be, can, and can be killed only by a silver bullet. Did you understand? So Jones uh, has taught everybody, I need a silver bullet. In order to kill me, you need a silver bullet. Uh, and he's thinking that nobody can kill him. However, he runs through the dense forest at night. He loses his way. He cannot find the buried food. He is tormented by his hallucinations. And finally, he falls right into the hands of the uh, people who were rebelling against him. The little formless fears, first hallucination, the figure of Jeff throwing dice mechanically, black prisoners in striped suits, an auction scene, a slave ship carrying black slaves, a witch doctor or shaman. Each of these hallucinations disappears when Jones fires at it, exhausting his bullets one by one. Okay, guys, that is the story of the uh, play Emperor Jones. Next, we'll talk about The Hairy Ape, another play by Eugene O'Neill, 1922. Are this is the 100th anniversary. This is 2022. We should celebrate, okay? 100th anniversary celebration of Hairy Ape, Ulysses, Wasteland, Jacob's Room. Why, why don't we celebrate? After my surgery, when I come back, we'll celebrate. What do you say? Wonderful. The Hairy Ape was first produced on 9th March, 1922 by the Provincetown Players. That is a very important Babbitt also, yes. Uh, Provincetown Players was a very important theatrical group that he co-founded. I have been teaching this for many years now, Provincetown Players, that he co-founded. And in Northeast Sled, this time they asked about Provincetown Players. I felt very happy because it is there in our presentation and many people never heard about it, but we have heard about it. We, I told you now, you should pay attention to every single point in the PowerPoint presentations because like 60% of the questions are directly from our material. So every small point like this also you should pay attention to. The hairy ape appealed to many labor groups and unions, working class groups, labor groups and working class groups, trade unions. Why? Because it is a little leftist. It strongly condemns the dehumanizing effects of industrialization. As you might know, the protagonist uh, of Harry Ape is Yank or Robert Smith or Bob Smith. Okay, all the same man. He is uh, working in the transatlantic ocean liner uh, made by Nazareth Steel. Nazareth Steel Company has made a transatlantic ocean liner. That is where um, Yank or Bob Smith is working. His 
job is to uh, take coal and put it in the stoke hole to run the engine. To run the engine, he has to um, take coal and put it in the stoke hole. It's a very difficult manual work. He has to work in the heat. He and his friends have to work in the heat. Uh, physical work it is. And Yank is continually compared to a beast in the play. But at the same time, he is also intellectually superior to his companions. He is described as a highly developed individual. Okay. Then listen very carefully. Okay, guys. Nazareth Steel um, actually is owned by a very rich industrialist. His daughter is Mildred uh, a very rich girl, an upper class girl, Mildred Rogers or Mildred Douglas. Mildred Rogers, isn't it? And um, she is traveling with her aunt. She is in the transatlantic ocean liner where Yank is working. Yank is not um, thinking too much about anything. He's happy with his class. He's comfortably belonging to that ship. And he's so proud that these uh, coal stokers are the people who are running the ship. He is very happy. Oh, Mildred, Mildred Douglas. Who is Mildred Rogers? Another character. Some Mildred Douglas. Okay. Ah, in uh, uh, of human bondage, I think Mildred Rogers, isn't it? Mildred Rogers is another famous character. All right. So. Um, he is actually happy doing his job. And then Mildred tells his, her aunt and the assistant engineer, I want to see the workers. I want to see how the other half of humanity lives because she is upper class. She wants to see how the working class people live. And with the, an assistant engineer, she goes to the Stokehold to see how the men there are working. And when she opens the Stokehold, door she is so horrified there are so many men there they are dark they are hairy in their bodies they are standing without shirts and they are sweating they are sooty dirt is there because it's cold now and uh, and she couldn't make out whether they are beasts or human beings so she said hairy beast or something oh beast she says and she is quickly taken away from there but when Yang, looking at Yang, she calls him beast, he becomes so furious. The other uh, people in the stokehold began uh, making fun of Yang. Everybody starts making fun of Yang. She calls you beast and Yang's class consciousness is awakened. He does not want to be called beast. He wants to be called human being. He's so furious. He wants to uh, defend himself and after that, he starts really thinking. The thinker is a famous statue made by uh, August Rodin. It is there in the front of our Western philosophy book. Haven't you seen it? Filthy beast, he, she says, yes. And uh, then after that, he starts thinking how to take revenge. He becomes aware of his class. He does not want uh, to be ill-treated like this because of his class. And the rest of the play is about how he uh, feels unhappy about his class. But he's unable to do anything. He's unable to think. His inability to think reveals his regression into a lower animal form. He uh, goes to the Fifth Avenue, the richest part of New York. He tries pushing people. He wants to take revenge on the upper classes. And he ends up, uh, land, he lands in prison for some time. And then in prison, he hears about the industrial workers of the world. They are a real association who existed in America, IWW. And he goes there, but he realizes that he doesn't belong there also. Because people have politics, even the association of working class people, they are not uh, very free to help everybody. So Yang then goes to New York Zoo and he opens a gorilla's cage, tries to sh shake hands with gorilla. And the gorilla crushes him to death. Hmm. He calls gorilla uh, brother. But the, why? what does that mean? This is expressionist. Don't take it realistically. This is not realism. It is expressionism. It is about the mind. And what does this mean? This means that 
Yang does not belong anywhere. He cannot belong to either working class or, you know, if you are lower class, it is like you are an animal. This is the meaning. Society treats you like an animal. So this is the meaning of the play. Yang's job as a coal stoker highlights his lower class status as against the upper class to which Mildred Douglas belongs. Yang is fierce, crude, and powerful like animals. Mildred is the pale, feeble, and spoiled daughter of the owner of Nazareth Steel. She's also unhappy in her class. In the beginning of the play, Yang seems proud to be a fireman. He defends the ship as his home. He insists that he is part of the engines. Mildred's reaction to Yang as a filthy beast awakens in Yang a class consciousness. That is a very important term in um, Marxism, class consciousness. Mildred and Yang share similar complaints about their class. Mildred describes herself as a waste product of her father's steel company. She yearns to find passion, to touch life beyond her cushioned bourgeois world. She wants to find another life, another passion. Yang has experienced too much of life that Mildred is yearning for. He has had enough more of, more, you know, too much of it. He now desires to topple the class structure. After Mildred's insult, Yang becomes class conscious. He begins to hate the rich. In a frenzy, he misbehaves with the churchgoers at Fifth Avenue. Are you following everyone? In a frenzy, he is misbehaving with the churchgoers and he's thrown into prison for a month. After being released, he tries to join the industrial workers of the world group and he's thrown out uh, of the industrial workers of the world group also. Did you understand? He doesn't belong anywhere. Uh, the next day he goes to the monkey zoo and uh, he finds the gorilla's cage open. The ape is sitting on his haunch like this, resembling the thinker. And uh, Yang opens the cage and tells gorilla, brother, uh, I, you, you and I are brothers. We don't belong anywhere. The gorilla crushes Yang, kills him. Oh. Yang releases the gorilla, the gorilla crushes Yang. Yang dies in the gorilla's cage as a chorus of monkeys is heard from surrounding cages. Thus Yang's quest to belong ends in disaster. This is the theme of morning, sorry, uh, Harry. Next we will talk about morning becomes Electra. All of you might have heard this. Morning Becomes Electra uh, is a play that is modeled on Orestia. People in YouTube, I accidentally went live while teaching the paid group. We are do doing Eugene O'Neill now. So I thought it's okay. You can also join us. That is how you are watching uh, me live now. If you are not a paid student, this is actually part of because of an accident. But uh, I need more treatment. That is why I'm not doing YouTube live these days. Okay, I will be back soon. So break is over, guys. O uh, Eugene O'Neill's Morning Becomes Electron is the adaptation of the myth of Orestia. He is transforming that myth and bringing it to New England in the 19th century, at the end of the Civil War. After the Civil War, uh, in New England, the story is set. This uh, play depicts the tragic decline of a prominent New England family named the Manans. You might know that Agamemnon's story is like this. Agamemnon killed his uh, daughter Iphigenia because he wanted to sacrifice her for uh, winning the war. So Agamemnon's wife, uh, Clytemnestra, was very angry with Agamemnon for this. Okay, and uh, uh, Clytemnestra took another lover. And when Agamemnon came back after the Trojan War, Clytemnestra and her lover Aegisthus killed Agamemnon. Agamemnon's death is mourned by his son Orestes and Electra. And uh, Orestes then kills uh, 
his mother this is the story of orestes orestes a story the same story is happening here agamemnon is represented by ezra the character the character is ezra orestes is the character orin o r i n orestes is orin like i always tell you will you read extra please read extra make a quick note of the characters names etc you will easily get it in one minute uh, then electra is lavinia electra is lavinia then uh, clytemnestra is christine okay uh, it was this play was written in france during o'neil's prolonged stay outside the us o'neil stayed outside the us for a long time and uh, like orestia this play is also made of three parts homecoming the hunted and the haunted three parts are there homecoming the hunted and the haunted now another play desire under the elms desire under the elms is also modeled on greek tragedy greek mythology getting me guys desire under the elms is a naturalistic play what do you mean by naturalistic play naturalistic play means a play that uh, shows characters as products of their environment O'Neill draws from Euripides's Hippolytus and Racine's Phaedre. There are two books that he uh, modeled on: Euripides's Hippolytus and Racine's Phaedre. The Puritan Ephraim Cabot is a widower. He has adult sons. Three sons he has. He abandons his farm to his three sons and goes traveling. of the three sons the youngest is eben eben is the brightest also he buys out his half brothers shares of the farm his two elder brothers are half brothers that means born of another mother what did eben do eben stole money from his own father bought the shares of his brothers and the brothers headed off to california to seek their fortune at this time what happens a frame cabot returns with a young beautiful wife called abby abby is very headstrong she doesn't listen to anybody and she falls in love with eben stepmother falls in love with stepson and then what happens one day abby gets into eben's bed at night abby goes to eben's bed sleeps with him bears his child she becomes pregnant ephraim cabot believes that the child is his but other neighbors are openly mocking them because they know it is eben's child now abby is so much in distress the child is sleeping in the cradle the mother abby is in distress thinking what will happen if a a frame cabot comes to know she wants eben so one day what did she do she kills the infant she goes and tells eben i killed him and eben is happy thinking she killed the father eben is happy thinking she killed the father but then he realizes that she killed the baby he can't forgive her for that he is enraged and distraught and eben turns abby over to the sheriff you know the policeman comes but and eben is also going with them he has acknowledged that he is also part of the crime he is also responsible and in a very famous ending do you know what happens at the end the sheriff is taking eben and abby and he looks around the farm and he is wondering how much this farm would cost hmm. that is a very ironic ending because everything in this play is dependent on money they are all money minded eben's greed for money ephraim cabot's uh, greed i mean they are all selfish they don't care for anybody else they care for their own materialistic pleasures <laughs> the sheriff is also not 
any different. Sheriff is also the same. He is also evaluating how much the farm would cost. I love that ending. When I read it, I was so shocked by the power of that ending. I liked it so much. Did you like it, guys? Now, um, another very famous play is The Iceman Cometh. This happens in New York, okay? This happens in New York. And uh, people in YouTube, uh, I am teaching the paid students. That is why suddenly, without any notice, I went live because I accidentally went public. But then I thought you might like watching me. So I thought to let it be. We are talking about Eugene O'Neill and we are going to talk about the Iceman Kamath, 1946. In New York, there is a village in the outskirts. Uh, in that village, Harry Hope is running a saloon. Saloon means place where people can come and uh, drink and all that. Harry Hope is running his saloon, village bar. There, uh, regular customers come. People come regularly to uh, drink. They are all friends. They are all neighbors and all people know each other, who know each other. And they're all sitting and sharing their pipe dreams. There are prostitutes, traders, old people, young people, all sorts of people are there in this crowd. And they are all sitting and telling each other their pipe dreams. They're all failures. All of them are failures. They are not heroes in any way. They are people who have achieved nothing in life. And they're all telling one another, they are fanciful, unattainable dreams. They are telling each other, I will be this, I will be that, I will do that, I will do this about tomorrow. But they're all uh, talking about things that may never happen. These empty dreams keep the men going. So this is actually indicating American dream. American dream was so positive and hollow. It did not mean anything, but it was necessary also. Many people went on and on with life only because dreams are there. If dreams are not there, we won't be able to go on. Now I need a surgery. So what I'm thinking when I come back, I will do this, I'll do that. I am talking, thinking about the future. You are all thinking about the future. We'll write the exam and then we'll do that. We'll pass. When we pass, we'll get this job. These dreams are what becomes our energy, isn't it? That is what helps us to move forward. Uh, so Larry Slade, one of these characters, is a 60-year-old Irish man. He was once a syndicalist anarchist. He has buried his five dreams. And as he has retired to a philosophical detachment. He is the only one who is not showing any pipe dreams. He is awaiting death. But that death itself is a pipe dream. You understand? And he, because he's not dry, dying, he keeps on longing for death, but he doesn't die. The group is all, all of them are expecting Hiki, their friend, to come. Hiki is a traveling salesman. And Hiki, they are hoping, will turn up. Because they want to celebrate Harry Hope's birthday. And Hickey has money. So they are hoping that Hickey will come and uh, buy them all drinks. Everything will be once again brightened up in the bar. It will be wonderful. Like that they are thinking and waiting for Hickey. And Hickey comes. When Hickey comes, what happens? When Hickey comes, he's a changed man. He is not the same as usual. He urges them to get rid of their pipe dreams. He's angry. Why are you having these dreams? They are not going to happen. Get rid of your pipe dreams. People are disappointed. Hiki, you know what happened? Hiki has murdered their dreams. Hiki comes and murders their dreams. So Hiki's coming is like the coming of the Iceman or death. You know, because losing your pipe dream means you are going to die. Without your dream, you will only die. Did you understand? Hiki's hope of getting rid of pipe dreams is another pipe dream. Because you can't completely get rid of your pipe dream. Your pi if not one dream, another dream, another hope will keep on coming. Hiki, being a wandering salesman, had led a wayward life. He led a wayward life. 
he just uh, had mistresses and spend his money like anything and his wife tried to reform him his wife wanted to reform him and that was her pipe dream to reform he was his wife's pipe dream do you do you understand guys and you know what he did he killed his wife to stop her from dreaming about him he has killed his wife he has come after killing his wife at the end he turns himself over to the police and he hopes to get the electric chair he is going to die ice man will come for hiki hmm. very depressing play one more play we will talk about are you tired after this we'll take a break i will end this video okay a uh, long days journey into night it came after the second world war did you notice the year 1957 the play opens in the tyron family in 1912 mary tyron james tyron's wife has just returned home after receiving treatment in a sanatorium james tyron's wife she has returned home after receiving treatment in a sanatorium for morphine addiction she was an addict drug addict and she has now been cured she has come back but in the play throughout the day she is again taking morphine she is again taking drugs again becoming an addict the use of the drug increases steadily as the day becomes night long day is becoming night the family is slowly ending they are they are becoming uh they, they are going to they are getting destroyed another disaster that happens in the family in the course of the play is that mary's younger son edmund is contracted tuberculosis edmund is actually eugene o'neil edmund contracts tuberculosis and other than edmund there is one more son jamie Jamie and their father they are alcoholic so everybody has something that is going to destroy them drug addiction or alcoholism or uh, tuberculosis all this happens in the play it shows that the play uh, will indicating that the family is going to get destroyed completely it is a metaphor for what happens in society at that time uh, the society is thus getting destroyed next uh, i will teach you literature of the depression era but i will now end this video okay thank you for watching us guys in you guys people in youtube uh, i i am undergoing a treatment so i will be back with youtube live later or i will put other videos thank you so much for all your support um this was a video that i accidentally went live with because i was teaching the paid students i hope you enjoyed it thank you